Jamie, so we did an interview about a year ago now, and it wasn't the interview I was expecting, because you, Stealing Fire had come out, what, a couple of years ago now? All about flow states, transformational culture, and what I was expecting was an interview about kind of the value of transformational culture and kind of how flow states are essential for our evolution and all of the, the stuff that was in Stealing Fire. And what you actually did was poured a kind of big bucket of cold water <laughs> all over that idea and just said, hang on, whoa, 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 we need to be careful because we've got all of these tools, but we're not using them properly. And it looks like we're going to make some of the same mistakes that everyone's always made with these technologies. How have you changed in the last sort of year since we spoke last time? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to say that that was just a, you know, whistling past the graveyard moment. But no, I think I'm actually far more pessimistic and concerned, actually, uh, in ways that I didn't even anticipate coming out of Stealing Fire. There were, there were some sort of obvious known issues that in the documenting of, hey, there's this revolution in non-ordinary states and not just flow states, but, you know, meditation and smart tech and psychedelics and kind of just pretty much every way in you can imagine people are starting to crack that code and put those things together, combine them, do all sorts of things. And at the time, I laid out three potential sort of known pitfall areas. The first was commodification, the idea that being able to um, hack our neurochemistry, our sort of the biology of bliss, that it could be used to sell us more shit. <laughs> and it absolutely 100% you know, has and is uh, in increasing quantities and the move into VR and AR and algorithmic social media and all those kind of things. It's pretty well documented. Most folks are actually more aware of that now and it's happening anyway. Uh, the other was weaponization and saying, hey, um, state actors um, with massive budgets are super interested in super soldiers and, and super interested in everything from mind control to performance enhancement that this whole range and again you know has been going on for the last half century plus uh, and it's simply we would just predict it would continue but the third one was sort of our own worst interest our, our the hedonism uh, and that element what <laughs> that element has shown up far more virulently than anything I sort of anticipated. And it really does feel that the sort of psychedelic renaissance or, or the stealing fire revolution, whatever you want to call it, is really just showing up as a children's crusade these days. And there's an awful lot of people kind of rushing in. Um, and we are actually, you know, finding ourselves, A, being led by people who don't know what they're doing. Um, B, in the, you know, the steepest part of kind of, you know, the Gartner Research Group's hype cycle idea that you know there's the there's the peak of expectations followed by the trough of disillusionment and then you know over time you kind of slowly and gradually get back to what's actually going to be the steady state promise and delivery of any given movement technology etc and so i think we are literally almost at the high point and just teetering on the brink of the crash which i would probably time stamp as any time in the next 18 to 36 months, uh, we would anticipate a collapse along a series of kind of fairly predictable vectors. And what do you think that crash is going to look like? Well, I mean, I think um, you can take it probably macroeconomic, medical professional, and then sort of social. And so um, speaking now, now if we kind of narrow the focus from a sort of over a broad revolution in ecstatic techniques and technologies and that kind of thing, it likes to actually get down to specifically, you know, what Michael Pollan has written about as the psychedelic renaissance, what is kind of, you know, really bubbling to the surface these days. Um, the first is it's not going to look anything like um, what the early revolutionaries, ambassadors and advocates hoped or wished. And that's just kind of table stakes. Things never do. You know, if Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson looked at the 2016 election, they'd be like, what the ever living fuck just happened, right? And even uh, a mentor of ours, John Mackey, who was the founder of Whole Foods, you know, you take the example of those guys and a little, a little bunch of little, you know, anarchist hippies in 1982 or 1983 in Austin, Texas, you know, building a health food store. And it was Birkenstocks and big bulk bins, you know, of bulgur and carob. And that was their thinking. And now it's, you know, now it's $20 a pound artisanal goat cheese and a plug-in for your Teslas and your Lexus hybrids. You know, on, the, on one hand, you would say, if you were an idealist from back at the inception of that thing, you would say, this is an utter corruption, mutation. This is not what we thought or what we wanted. But on the other hand, Whole Foods, at least 
prior to Amazon acquisition, right? Whole Foods has been an absolute global market maker in organic foods and additional companies like Trader Joe's, like Costco, even Walmart is now the, has the largest private label organic brands. None of that would have happened were it not for that Whole Foods growth arc and curve into the thing it, no one at the inception could have seen. So just as a general premise, whatever this turns out to be, it is probably not going to look anything like um, people at Boomfest or people at Burning Man or even the kind of, um, you know, elders of the 1960s um, movements would have imagined, hoped, wanted, or even recognized as their own offspring. So let's just ass assess that, that, you know, no, no, um, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy and nor does any disruptive technology. Um, but at the, you know, and actually along those lines, um, one of the simplest things that we will see is we'll see capture by big pharma. So, um, you know, most psychedelic compounds are, um, you know, beyond um, patents. They're all expired. They're all open source, which has no interest in innovation, and no interest in the ability to capture and, and set pricing. So what we've already seen is things like Epidiolex, the first synthetic cannabinoid that has now been approved for um, seizure use, epileptic seizure use. We've just seen the, uh, the approval by Johnson & Johnson of esketamine, so an intranasal ketamine uh, variation. And we, can ex we would expect and anticipate much, much more of that, that there will be the attempt to come back in with large R&D budgets, large IP protection, tweaking and modifying molecules um, in order to get it back into the stack of big pharma, product launch development, price setting, et cetera. And again, as we said, already seeing that happen, and we should expect a lot more of that. In conjunction with that, we'll probably see, um, and again, to the chagrin of the revolutionaries, we will see a, an isolation and a backing out of many of the uh, subjective you know, qualities that um, aficionados or enthusiasts see as central. So if you look at the World Health Organization's descriptions of ketamine and nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide even, just take those two experiences, uh, they will, they will just, you know, in one line, they will say, you know, known side effects, you know, excess ideation, <laughs> you know? And you're like, yeah, that's actually why all, um, all non-prescribed users are using this stuff by the time you get it into a, the medical industrial complex, right? Those are actually seen as, as um, problems to manage, not central reasons to, to do. And so what we will quite likely see in addition to the tweaking of molecules for patentable and controllable process and price setting, you will also see um, an isolation of basically biomedical uh, input. So for instance, ketamine on the one hand, this tends to disclose at high doses, profoundly strange and either, you know, terrifying or deeply valuable, depending on your experience and your disposition, interior realms and domains. On the other hand, it's an excitatory glutamate receptor site, antidepressive-ish. So what we will see is we'll see the, the isolation and the focusing on certain biomedical mechanisms of action and often the, the partitioning or the minimization of some of the interior subjective ones that are typically what everybody thinks of when they think of psychedelics. So that will be happening. And what you could broadly say is we will see, you know, we, we wanted, you know, we sort of, we, we thought we were getting Woodstock and we're going to get Prozac Nation 2.0. For the time being, um, it's a very high margin, high turnover product to be pushing. So if you take, for instance, ketamine clinics, which are now booming in the United States, I think there's over 300 at the last time I checked, and there's probably more now, and there's a lot of other companies coming in and, and looking to do scale rollouts. A huge part of that is that the floor, typically for ketamine therapy, is 500 bucks an hour. And the ceiling is anywhere from $1,000 to $1,500 an hour, depending on location and kind of service level. So you have an awful lot of people just being like, oh, shit, that's actually good churn. You get, you get lots of people in and out, and you get very high dollar, very high margin, relatively easy thing. Sit here, let me jab in an IV. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> and, and, and you make sure you're okay. You can, you can, you can summon an Uber or a Lyft, and, and you know, you're safe as houses. So there are right now, quite strong market incentives to pull more people into this space than may have the grounding experience, ethical orientation, or sense of the nuance and the complexities of it. 
um, at the same time, you also have, um, you know, in, 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 due, in some part, due to that driver, it's a good way to make, to do profitably decent things for, for patients. You also have, um, you also have sort of psychedelic novices in the helping professions coming in, whether that's a general practitioner, MD, or even a trained psychiatrist. We were actually at a MAPS, I was speaking at a MAPS benefit dinner uh, not too long ago and sat at a table with a really well-intentioned psychiatrist who had been coming up through conventional Western medicine, had not surprisingly found that tools for anxiety, suicide, depression, weren't always working, were looking for additional tools, and had, had literally come to it from a very kind of conventional, stepwise, professional inquiry, um, and had attended a ketamine licensing ther you know, therapy protocol, and part of that was one experience with ketamine themselves, so they knew at least a little bit about what they're doing. That was you know, 12 months prior. So this, this is a person who had no prior exposure to psychedelics, so psychedelic novice, one exposure for their own experience of ketamine, and then dropped into administering it. And they had all kinds of surprises. They, they, you know, they, they had patients who, didn't, who were freaking out when they had their first kind of slipping of egoic self-reference, um, screaming and shouting. They, didn't, they basically just had no idea the waters they were wading into. And yet they were the licensed and certified professional. So back to kind of known side effects or excess ideation <laughs> versus that is the whole point. We have a lot of folks um, not knowing what they're getting into, getting into it for economic kind of business model reasonings um, and not necessarily an understanding of how to skillfully midwife patients through that experience. If you're really just thinking, take this medicine, it does an glutamate excitatory response. We're not quite exactly sure how it works, but it seems to have at it. And then all the other things, all the interior content that's coming up, we don't actually have a place for that. We don't have a place for it in our service model. We don't have a place for it in our integration and aftercare. And we don't have a place for it in our own minds and experiences. Um, that's going to set up for a lot of problems. And then now compound, compounding on all that. So you've got a gold rush into the space. You've got under-informed people administering with less than fully supportive integrative protocols because they literally don't know what they don't know and they're treating this as they would any other prescription pharmaceutical. Take it, watch the side effects, go home, call us in the morning kind of thing. And you're, then you're also seeing, predictably, this is, is this uh, Clayton Christensen uh, at Harvard Business School, you know, talked about market disruptions and how this happens. People come in at the top with high margin, high dollar stuff, and then there's kind of a rush to a bottom and there's disruptors that come in. Well, what we're already seeing, and I've just, just had someone send this, uh, I just kind of read this a couple of weeks ago, somebody sent this in my inbox. Um, we're seeing novel adaptations to the business models. So there's a group who's now looking to do ketamine therapy, which is typically like best practice protocols for that uh, six sessions for three to five thousand dollars, right? And it's a, usually it's a batch. You kind of you buy it, you pay it up front. It's not always covered by insurance, right? So it's high cash, cash up front, and then you get that experience. Well, now there's a group that's looking to do nine hundred dollars. You come in, you have your first ketamine session in an office with direct oversight, blood pressure cuff, you know, monitoring. And after that, you've got take home lozenges. So you're like, okay, so now there's going to be a rush to the bottom. So we've got a gold rush <laughs> and we've got a bunch of people piling in. Now we're going to have massive public availability and a lot more people, both clinicians and patients coming into this experience at the same time that all the margins are getting massively undercut and there's going to be a race to the bottom. So quality of care, the sophistication and complexity of what can be done, because how many dollars do we have to devote to this, you know, against existing medical models of just pop a pill, go home. You know, we're not even going to do talk therapy anymore because that doesn't work out. That doesn't pencil out on the health insurance, <laughs> you know, uh, codes. Um, we're likely to see an erosion of care and an erosion of support, and it will become more and more transactional at the very moment that it actually should become more and more integrative and holistic. The final one is just the social. So what's happening outside of Big Pharma, what's happening outside of the medical uh, clinical professions, um, and, and what are we seeing uh, just in the level of enthusiasts who are now sort of hashtag because science 
you know, they're, they're seeing these studies, they're, they're taking this research as validation of their own extracurricular efforts and explorations, as well as the entire gray market economy that fully lives in, in that space. And so we're seeing, um, I mean, back to that idea of the children's crusade, um, we're seeing um, basically narcissism, hedonism, and, and commercialism showing up in the social sphere as well. And, and so the narcissism is, is one I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't anticipate the virulence with which this is happening. But, you know, that, that sort of idea of, um, you know, they've done a, a fair number of studies these days with like the rise of super flus because of the excess prescription of antibiotics. Right, so doctors are just like, oh, in and out, here's an end, you know, you say you've got the sniffles, you say you've got a cold, I don't even care, because I know that, A, you'll leave my office quickly if I give you a prescription, B, you'll rate me more highly on my online thing, so I'm just going to give you antibiotics. And you know, everybody knows that if you start taking antibiotics, even if you feel symptom-free, you should keep taking them to the end, right, because otherwise that tiny little leftover of bacteria or whatever can come roaring back worse than ever. And so because of that, over the last several decades, we've created super viruses, super flus, and, and it's the overprescription of antibiotics. And you could make a fairly clear case that we're in that neck of the woods with psychedelics too, which is that people are taking them and they're getting almost rid of their egos and not quite. And they're, st they're symptom free. They're like, I'm a golden god, whatever. Right? I'm going to open my own workshop. I'm going to do this thing. And that, that egos are coming roaring back more virulent than ever. So we're getting super egos. And not only is that literally just um, you know, a case of people not having any lineage background, not a sense of discipline, not a sense of the length, complexity, nuance, difficulty of actually fully growing up as people, just developmentally informed kind of psychology juxtaposed against lineage practice. Um, but it's also being amplified by social media loops. So now we're having people, you know, no sooner are they having an experience of ego dissolution or, you know, whatever might else occur in these spaces, then they are composing their social media posts and snapping selfies. Here's me down in the jungle, Wachuma, you know, oh, amazing. Or here's me at Burning Man, or here's me just coming out of my ayahuasca retreat in Williamsburg. And whether it's the prevalence of folks like Joe Rogan and things like that, where you have public pod, public figures effectively openly talking about these things, plus the ability for me to then share and virtue signal uh, of my rate, latest breakthrough or my latest insight or just us living the life, um, that is absolutely um, reskinning our egos faster than we're able to get rid of them. And you can see that, I mean, the simplest example, you know, you're familiar probably with like the Museum of Ice Cream and those kind of interactive, you know, museums and installations around the world that are popping up these days. And they're, they're fun, they're whimsical, they're cute, but what they really are are Instagram backdrops. You know, so people are going less to be immersed in the actual moment and the actual delight than they are to be capturing it in a very contrived fashion for an audience that's not co-located with them. It's, it's for digital, digital selves. And I noticed uh, that, I didn't know what I was looking at actually when I first saw it, but three, four years ago, there was an inflection point at Burning Man. And you know, if folks aren't familiar with that, it's, a, it's an outdoor festival in the desert and the desert is, you know, it's, it's one of the salt flats. So it's completely a flat white expanse. And there's, you know, one of the most compelling things about that place is this, these larger than life art exhibits. And so this white flat desert becomes effectively like an amazing gallery. And they're giant, they're, they're just oversized, you know, 50 feet tall, 60 feet tall giant things and they're almost all interactive there's something about the art it's not to be passive and go mm, yes i love his use of color and composition and form you know you engage with it you hang on it you swing on it there's a joke there's an interaction there's something that shifts your state they're all psychedelic art in that respect or ecstatic art in that sense and what's what's been happening in the last few years is you're like oh shit this is just the museum of ice cream in the desert people are just literally coming up to art not not interacting with it as humans not not allowing themselves to be moved or transformed by it but literally just using it as backdrops for their own social media profile so digital narcissism has overlaid with the psychedelic renaissance 
uh, in ways that is, and, it, and it's, it's a little bit like that Kurt Vonnegut book, Cat's Cradle, you know, where ice nine is that weird molecule that can freeze all of all water molecules on the earth and basically end life, right? And it almost feels like digitally fueled psychedelic narcissism is like ice nine. It is just encasing our world in super egos faster than we can actually melt them. Uh, and that's fucking horrifying. You know, because like these are arguably the most powerful tools that humans have ever assembled to get out of ourselves. And yet these other tools we've built, right, which leaves us in the echo chambers of ourselves, have actually co-opted that enterprise. And so that's, yeah, that's, that's a horrific thing. Um, the next is just kind of hedonism, which is, again, permission with, with the psychedelic renaissance, with all the profound work that's happening with MAPS and Imperial College and a lot of the other folks that are just heads down doing amazingly ethical, principled work in service of the people who are hung out to dry. I mean, the people who are just suffering from debilitating trauma and anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation and just really, you know, out of, out of options. There's that profound and beautiful work and, you know, and we wrote about it in Stealing Fire, the idea that one to three um, sessions of MDMA-assisted therapy, for instance, um, can just profoundly take a load off um, somebody who's been carrying those burdens themselves without help, without relief. Um, it's beautifully uplifting. Um, but the reality is, is that 33 or 303 sessions, um, you know, off-label, uh, done on my own time, done recreationally, or even with an intention. There, there's an asymptote of return on investment. Um, those folks aren't 10 times as changed or transformed as the people who have done it once or three times. And so my sense is, is that there's increased permission, you know, the because science, I'm microdosing because science, we're tripping on the weekends because science, and, I, and there's a sort of absolution of, well, are we making the most of it? Are we integrating this? Is this actually leaving me a better person? Or are these just different bright lights to go chase? Is this just novelty? Is this just chemically induced um, well-being that is fleeting and we're not actually doing the work around it? Um, and the final one is just commercialism or commodification which kind of is the first two, the, the narcissism plus the hedonism plus commercialism, which is the idea that in this age of, you know, anyone can be an expert and all you need to do is publish an ebook and set up a blog and, you know, put out a, put out a shingle and have an evite and see, see what guppies come. Um, there is this bizarre disconnect between depth of experience, apprenticeship, humility to the vastness of the psychedelic realm, let's say, and people's absolute brazen willingness to dip their toe in it, to claim the mantle, and to turn around and shill their expertise to utter newbies and newcomers. So I've, you know, I'm an apprentice in training, or I'm a shaman in training. What, what you've, you've been to Peru twice, or maybe three times, and you've tripped a bunch at home, and you're now actually presuming to lead people through experiences that you've barely begun to fathom yourself. And if you think about like, um, and in which we're seeing this trend in, in both places, you know, like um, what's happening in the psychedelic realm is also happening in uh, extreme sports where you're having more and more people toe into Jaws, this giant wave in Maui, you know, because they've seen it on Red Bull and they have no business. They haven't come up through the ranks of watermen. <laughs> you know, they want the selfie, what was called GoPro courage. You know, and we're seeing, you know, the same with mountaineering. There are people on 8,000 meter peaks now who literally are summiting, you know, with a guy dragging them up, short roped, just literally can, like a dog on a leash. I mean, connected to carabiners in a harness and literally getting dragged up the mountain. And it's time to rappel off the summit and they've never rappelled before. You know, so you're like, what on earth is going on? You know, people are bit, largely because of social media, they are ending up in places they have no business being. But now we're even getting to the place where people are presuming to lead others from that spot. And it's the sense of, can I gain money, fame, privilege, prestige? There's, there was a particular info marketer I saw that just made me cringe. They was talking about, you know, we will take you down to, to Peru. We're going to host a medicine journey retreat where you will download wealth codes Right, and we're the ones to help you, and we have coached 
dozens of people to million dollar business. And all this is shot selfie infomercial style as I walk around my rented mansion in Bali telling you that we've unlocked the universal source codes of abundance and we too can help you for as little as a $10,000 retreat. So, you know, the last gasps of cultural appropriation as well as, you know, in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed shall rule. And we're seeing a ton of that as well. So that's kind of, those are just the factors I'm watching, you know, and, and, and I would imagine that, um, I mean, A, they're all already happening. So none of this is sort of, um, you know, Cassandra, you know, imagining worst scenarios and saying, well, what if that happens? These are all already happening. The question is just where do they lead us? Hmm. Lots to pick up on. The, the one thing from, from earlier, uh, you mentioned that the, there's a sort of bifurcation where medicine is looking for the, the medical effect while not being interested in the, the psychedelic effect. But a lot of people in the psychedelic medicine space would say that the, those two things are together. Like the, 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 especially with, for example, psychedelic mushrooms, that feeling of oneness, that internal subjective effect is the therapeutic effect. So with most of them, that's not going to be possible, is it? To, to disassociate, to, to, to bifurcate those two things. Yeah, and I think it's, I think it's great that uh, a number of the therapists um, that are working in this space are actually, and somewhat strangely, within Western clinical medicine, courageously saying it's some of these interior experiences that are actually valuable and we need to notice them and protect them and, and build our protocols around them. And the question will simply be, to what extent does that persist? Um, because again, with um, large pharmaceutical companies tweaking molecules, they're go th th that's actually a messy aberration. The interior subjective experience is not clinically controllable and manageable. So wherever possible, and this is, you know, as, as we've seen with Epidiolex, right? Here's a cannabinoid, rather than just like, here's cannabis that grows out of the ground or grows in a greenhouse and it works. They're like, oh, get away that pesky high. Let's isolate it, isolate it, isolate it to do the one thing for the disease case that we're trying to solve for, chop it all up, repackage it, rebrand it, and mark it up. Um, so that will be a question as to how long that persists. Does that now grow? Because that's actually the truth of the matter, which is that majority of the healing is actually changing my relationship to myself and to my narratives and what's happening on a neurochemical and even neuroplastic level are the structural correlates to that change. Or are we gonna try and wring out those, those known side effects um, to create a more manageable process in the sort of industrial medicine thing? So that's, you know, TBD. Um, but obviously, you know, full hats off to the folks that are taking a stand for that. And I know that some of the people, so I've done, I've done quite a few um, pieces about psychedelic medicine over quite a few years. And I know that there's always been a sense of this tension between the scientific model and the experience itself. And I know that some people, even within psychedelic medicine, are having, they're torn because they're thinking, well, we have an idea and some of the results that have come out from the latest one in the UK uh, with Robin Carhart Harris, a lot of the the people who went through it had a uh, they were relieved of their symptoms of depression for sort of three months at a time, yeah. but then it would it would often come back. Yeah. And this sense, everyone who's taken psychedelics kind of knows that yeah, you get this afterglow period, but you have to put in some changes to your lifestyle or changes to your 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 lived experience in those three months if they're going to be sustainable. Yeah. So people are being forced into a medical model that maybe is not helpful to them creating meaningful change in their lives and meaningful change for their conditions. Yeah, I mean, if you take the most kind of extreme boundary case I can think of, which is something a psychedelic like 5-MeO DMT, which is, you know, arguably, and I don't think many people actually argue this, is, you know, the most potent compound that humans have ever had access to. And you come across folks who have anecdotally had, you know, one experience, three experiences, five experiences, and I've been kind of watching over the last five years, like, hmm. And, and you know, people come back, you know, hair on fire for, you know, this amazing exposure to what some people just say is literally unmitigated, um, you know, submersion in, you know, fill in your superlative, <laughs> you know, consciousness, light, <coughs> Godhead, 
the, the, the universe, ultimate truth. I mean, truth like burning bush, Ark of the Covenant, you know, level stuff. And I haven't seen a single one of the personality structures, structures shift. And in fact, particularly kind of West Coast, um, New York, you know, that, that, that the kind of chattering classes who are, who are most able to access this stuff, um, it almost feels like it's just one more bauble to hang on the Christmas tree. Um, and like, like going to a hip, you know, do you get front row tickets to Hamilton? And that is pretty sobering. I think, and should put the rest of it in context, which is, is if, you know, if you go to developmental psychology and say Bob Keegan at Harvard University, folks, you know, people who have been studying this stuff for decades and really taking a look at like human change in adult development is hard and slow and iffy. And there's no specific or singular intervention that absolves us of that incremental work. And if you have a peak breakthrough experience, I mean, A, you know, we're going, we're, we're going to the waterfall with thimbles. So in some respects, the, the excess of information that typically comes through in a psychedelic state, there's only, there's only a fraction of that that we actually can sort of bring back into our waking state consciousness and into our lives. And in fact, sometimes it's contraindicated that there is no point getting lobbed up to 100,000 feet if you can only breathe down to the first 20, 26,000 feet. Um, so there's a lot of overshooting the mark of what can I translate into my life. And then there's often a lack of, as you said, you know, the hard dedicated work of, of, of integration um, that particularly when it's so much more tempting to go back to the wishing well, <laughs> right? Versus doing the shitty hard stuff. Um, that people are often neglecting that even more when they have these quick little bypasses. If I can only get to that place after two decades of meditation practice, for instance, it's slow, it's distractive, no one's got time for that these days. There's a whole lot of reasons why traditional monastic practices or, or martial practices may or may not fit perfectly with pal mal 21st century society, but they had some checks and balances in them, and you had to have prepared the vessel before you poured in the sort of water of life. Now we're just swimming, splashing around and spilling tons because anybody can get there um, with very little effort and as a result, and, and we're not balancing it um, with, the, with the work afterwards. What do you think about the, the mix between the scientific model and the psychedelic research? It seems like an awkward fit, however you spin it. Sure. I mean, you know, you end up with sort of p-hacking and placebo effects, you know, so basically the idea that double-blind placebo-controlled studies, I mean, A, don't work that well in psychedelics because you really know in a heartbeat whether you got the fake one or the real one. And so even when they've done, you know, like take niacin instead of psilocybin, so you get kind of a flushing and a tingling, but no psychoactive effects. It's pretty hard uh, to, to cram psychedelic research into that specific pharmaceutical trials model. The other element is that um, the interior subjective experiences, which are arguably um, a large chunk of the value and impact of these things, um, don't subject themselves to controlled measurement. You can do subjective analysis and surveys and things, but again, what are you tracking? Are you tracking like a, um, a mystical state inventory AKA what wild ass crazy shit did I see while I was there? Okay, useful, but not definitive. Are we discussing behavioral change, um, shift in adult developmental complexity? If so, that stuff doesn't often change that fast. Or if it does momentarily have kind of a, an afterglow effect, it's gonna return fairly close to baseline. And you're really, you can, you can, you can pick things up like long-term stage development, maybe in a six month window, but usually it's, 12, 18, 36 months or longer to really see the arc of someone growing up as an adult. And so our tools and our timelines, just clinical trial and how long are you in them, um, don't, don't particularly submit to that. And if it's a multivariable equation that creates the transformation, which is, I mean, even just take it out of the labs, what's, what happens where somebody might have an epiphany? You might be in the rainforest with an indigenous shaman traveling out of your country, out of your language, out of your comfort zone, different bioregion, all those things combining to have the ayahuasca experience you had. 
or if you're at a transformational festival and there's light and there's sound and there's music and there's companionship and there's all these things and a psychedelic compound and it was the entire thing that of that evening or of that day or that week or whatever it was that cracks you open how do we back all those things out and so my sense is, is that we probably need different research protocols if we're really going to try and sort of F the ineffable, if we're going to really try and pin down what is the juju or what is the transformational magic and how can we both understand it better and help more of it happen more healthily for more people. Um, it would almost be the sort of the kitchen sink method, which is um, figure out all the factors that for sure crack people wide open. Study that. And then you just can back off, back off individual um, elements until you get an undesired drop off in efficacy, and that's a that's a different way of doing it. Um, but I think we can't we can't think that atomizing elements and measuring them in isolation ever adds up to the mystery. We might need to start with the things that we know for sure and deliver glimpses of the numinous. And then we know those are there, there. And then we can start figuring out, you know, reverse engineering or sort of almost regression analysis. Um, what were the elements that were overwhelmingly contributive versus just kind of nice window dressing? And do you think that psychedelics can ever be offered within uh, a Western medical paradigm? Well, I mean, I think, I think the medical paradigm was essential for socio-political legal reasons. And that's why there's been an effort, that's why there was an initial emphasis on treatment resistant depression and anxiety, those kind of things, because that's actually how it works. It works within the legal codes, it works within the system to say, okay, if these people are absolutely out of options, then we might allow something more radical or innovative, et cetera. The thing that we're missing is is why would we why would we use it? What is the ethic of use? What is the orientation? And it feels to me like at a minimum there's at least like three super functional uses for peak states in general. I mean, psychedelics are, are a use case, but they're not the only one. But it, it's the idea of like, first of all, is metronome. You know, I am out of step with life, the pulse, the rhythm, but I can't quite, I don't know for sure, right? I'm, I'm busy, I'm hectic, I'm distracted, I'm all these things. And I drop in to a psychedelic state or any other, you know, skillfully produced ecstatic space. And I'm like, oh, this is where the one is. This is where the metronome is telling me the beat is. And I can, I can correct. I might have been half, half a beat late. I might have been half a beat early. Whatever it is, I can correct. And now I'm on the one. And the next one is tuning fork. You know, again, running and going through life, we bump into things, we get hit, we get hurt. Our instrument, our bodies, our brains, our hearts, our minds gets knocked out of whack. And we're just suddenly, we think this is a C, but it's actually C sharp, or we're a little bit flat. And we're like, oh, okay, I'm trying to play with others, but I'm actually sharp or flat. Let me tune my instrument. And so the metronome and the tuning fork do a beautiful job with that. And if you think, you know, to continue the musical metaphor, musicians all use metronomes and tuning forks, but they don't spend their entire day fiddling with knobs and strings and flipping the pendulum back and forth. The moment they've got the one, and the moment they've got a clean C, they go off to make music. They either practice it themselves or they go jam with others. And I think that's the relationship we really need with psychedelics. Not that we just constantly, you, you just hit the bell, hit the bell, fiddle the knobs, fiddle the knobs. The idea is like, get yourself in tune, get yourself on time, go jam. That's the point. The point is to go make the music of life together. And, you know, and the final one is a little bit just sort of training wheels. And, and I think this is one where the once in a blue moon psychedelic experience, you know, once in a lifetime, once a year, whatever it would be, um, needs to be supplemented because what we're missing, I think, are the sort of the, the weekly Sabbath. Can we dust that bastard off and reinvigorate it? Because you know, the once a month, the once a, a season, you know, solstices, equinoxes, whatever the hell, you know, take your pick on calendar preference. But what do I do recurringly and periodically? Because one of the things that the research, you know, the research that MAP's been doing with MDMA therapy, right, is that it does something very specific. It shifts your neurochemical profile. And actually, uh, Rick Doblin was just sharing with me the last time he and I talked that the closest neurophysiological analog 
they've found to somebody in an MDMA therapeutic dosage session is post-orgasm. And it's a state of satiety, right? You have, you have oxytocin, you have prolactin, right? you've got an increase in serotonin. Basically feelings of safety, security, belonging, well-being. And that that actually allows people to relax their vigilance response, turn off their amygdala and their, and their threat scanning, and, be, and have a little bit of distance between themselves and their stories and their past pains. And that that alone can be transformational. So what is it like for us to have to supplement the once in a blue moon uh, notion of deep psychedelic dives um, with the idea of what are we doing one day out of seven? <laughs> what are we doing one day out of 30 or 90? And can we use those experiences to defrag our nervous systems and really open our hearts and expand our minds and say, okay, now I've got a sense of this, I have a somatic marker for how this feels. Can I use this experience as training wheels? Can I actually go into the next day, the next few days even? How long can I keep this up? How long can I practice living from a more courageous, more vulnerable, more open state until that becomes muscle memory, until that becomes as familiar right, as my old contracted reactive state? And I think that, that that's that combination. It's sort of shoot the moon once in a blue moon, right? Integrate the hell out of it. And every and, and much more regularly in smaller doses, can I do the metronome tuning fork training wheel game and live into the better angels of our nature, live into what's what, what my highest, most generous, expansive self might be. And if... Uh, You've been documenting this culture for quite a long time. What would you say that you're, you're at now? Are you sounding the alarm? Do you think that anything can be done to mitigate the kind of the, the dangers that you've spelled out? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was rather than sort of sounding the alarm because no one's going to fucking listen, right? <laughs> That's the other trouble with the psychedelic movement is it's antinomian inherently, which means, um, you know, not subject to uh, deference to authority of any shape or form. It's why, you know, in the 50s and 60s, the U.S. Army started dosing soldiers to see if they could use it as a disorient on the battlefield. And, you know, one of the unintended side effects was a bunch of, you know, a bunch of enlisted dudes were like, what the fuck am I doing in this uniform? And I'm going to just put this gun down and I'm going to go home now. So there, I think that Jeremiah's, you know, from positions of authority, highly unlikely to work. Um, but what I would say is actually more, rather than a, a warning bell, more of a clarion call which is, hey, good news, folks, is we have access to um, a higher concentration of ecstatic and transformative technologies, social technologies, than any humans ever have on the planet, full stop. And we may not have the luxury to linger in the transition. And you can assign this, you can say, hey, these are earth changes and higher order things all conspiring to provide us these tools of this time, you know, and some folks do, some folks will make a case that like ayahuasca has an, an agency and an intelligence, right? And it's coming into this world, not, not unlike the Dalai Lama saying, hey, the Chinese had to come and do horrendous things in our country to blow us out of Tibet, of that isolation to bring the Dharma to the West, you know, kind of just so stories of the psychedelic Renaissance. I don't think you have to go there. You could just simply say, hey man, shit's happening and it's here. But it's here just in time, and we might not get the chance to gawk and dawdle um, in the magic and wonder of our own transformations. It may be like, here's the tools, folks. Wake yourself up, rip the fucking band-aid off, and, and you know, get your wobbly legs about you, and then you're needed. Like, we are needed. This is not to become this self-obsessive, recursive, endless personal journey game. Maybe the hippies got to try that. We don't. Uh, we're all needed and we're needed at full strength and not just in ourselves, but with and for each other. And so that would be my, um, if I had anything to share, <laughs> it would be that. Like we've got the tools, now we have to use them and there's not a moment to spare. Great. Jamie, thank you.